Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Early Music Podcast. Today, we are talking about rediscovering lost music and the factors at play when it comes to learning about the context surrounding that music's creation. So, are you ready for this? Join me in our combined strength. Bring order to the galaxy. This is the Early Music Podcast with your host, Andrew Byrne. Brought to you by Rayma, the Early Music Network. Kawabunga. Episode 10. I think it's important to note before we really get in deep on this episode that there is a star power problem when it comes to the music of the Renaissance. That's both in the re-performance of that music today, but also in the context of the past. There is an expectation of that name. It helps audiences to put that music into context. So you come to a concert, you know, if it's Palestrina, Monteverdi, Bach, you know what you're going to get. That's Laurie Strauss, Professor Emerita of Music at the University of Southampton. You know, there's that uh, great story in Castiglione, in The Courtier, when uh, Elisabetta Gonzaga presents the, the group with a piece and they're not very impressed by it. And then she says, ah, but it's by Jasca. And they go, oh, no, it's great. It's great. Laurie is going to be speaking to us today about the Bifoli Sostegni manuscript which contains religious music from 16th century Florence. It is a modest manuscript. Um, it's, a, it's in choir book format, and it is uh, it, it ended up in the Bibliothèque du Conservatoire Royal in Brussels. Nobody is quite sure how or, or when. That is to say how or when the manuscript made it to the library. It's kind of hefty. It's about 300 pages, uh, maybe more. It has 78 pieces in it, and it's all voci pari, equal voice polyphony. So all of the voices singing in the same register in three and four parts. And all of the music um, pertains to a convent. And we know this because of the binding of the manuscript, which is these beautiful leather covers, and they are embossed with gold letters. And on either side of the binding, there's a name of a nun, uh, Angioletta or Agnoletta Bifoli, and Clemencia Sostegni. And their their family crests uh, are, or once were kind of embossed also in little medallions on the covers. If you're interested in taking a look at this book, we have a couple of photos on the website dedicated to this episode. You'll find the link in the description of the podcast. So we know it comes from a convent, and we know that the music pertains to uh, to convent worship. Um, but until a few years ago, we didn't know quite what convent. Is all of the music anonymized, or can you recognize the compositions of certain composers within it? Okay, so out of those 78 pieces, nine of them can be attributed. Um, only three of them are attributed actually in the manuscript. There are concordances or you know other, other books that can tell us at least one name of a composer. Some, some of the pieces have more than one name um, in, in, in different publications or different manuscripts. So, you know, that whole attribution thing is always really contested um, in the in the early 16th century. But no, I mean, really, 80, 85% of the pieces in the book are anonymous. When was this manuscript first studied or looked at in the modern day? An Italian musicologist, Lucia Boscolo, um, it did quite a, a an extensive preliminary study describing the manuscript, which she published back in the 1990s. 
And um, two very eminent musicologists, um, James Haar and Ian Fenlon, took a bit of an interest in the manuscript because of who copied it. But it sort of sat there languishing and nobody really understood or, or knew what the music sounded like until um, I started looking at it in around 2015. There were two possible convents where this manuscript could have originated. Could you tell us about them? The book is very clearly from a convent um, of the Second Order of Franciscans, the Clarissan Order, the Order of St. Clair. And right at the very beginning of the book, uh, there is a hymn for the office of the evangelist. So I thought, okay, so maybe, you know, maybe it would be one of those, one of, you, you, you haven't got that many apostles or evangelists. There were only two convents in Florence at which this hymn would have been a big deal. And one of them was San Jacopo in Via Ghibellina, which is, was, was a big, rich convent right down in the middle of town, next to probably the most famous convent in Florence, uh, Le Murate. And uh, on the next block, there's Santa Verdiana. So these were three musical convents and Le Murate was the one that had like the most splendid music in, in Florence. So that was one of them, San Jacopo and Via Ghibellina. Um, and then there was also the possibility that it was San Matteo in Arcetri, which is a very modest, small, relatively poor convent, a mile south of the of the gates of, of Florence, up in the hills south of the Palazzo Pitti. It was going to be one of those two. And for years, I chased San Jacopo. I was trying to find the names of these nuns in the archive of I mean, the archival papers pertaining to San Jacopo because it seemed to me much more logical that a large manuscript of polyphony would come from a rich, well-appointed convent in the middle of Florence that would have needed music. Now, I'm a bit biased in this reporting, but I have to say this is where the story gets really interesting for me. Lori, were there any other factors which made you want to chase San Jacopo as the origin of the manuscript first? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, some listeners may, uh, may know that my group and I made a CD in 2017 called Lucrezia Borgia's Daughter. And this was the, um, the culmination of about nine years of research for me on specific printed volume of anonymous motets from the 1540s. And I did a lot of very painstaking argument and research uh, to suggest that the composer of at least some of these most motets was Suor Leonora d'Este, the daughter of Lucrezia Borgia and uh, Duke Alfonso the first of Ferrara. And, you know, my, I'm perfectly happy with my, with my musicological arguments, but at the time there was a big television series on the Borgias. I don't want to seem like a prude, but in fact, there were two Borgia TV series being published simultaneously at the time. I was accused by some reviewers basically of just jumping on the Borgia bandwagon. Okay, sorry to interrupt once again, but just to be clear, the Borgias didn't actually have their own bandwagon, did they? No. <laughs> no. Okay. No. Sorry, I totally sidetracked this. So, the critics were accusing you of jumping on the Borgia bandwagon because... It would have been a, a good way of selling a CD. And, and at that time, I hadn't published all of my musicological research. That, you know, that took a few, uh, a few more months to come out. But... Um, but yeah, it stung. It really stung because I'd done all of this really hard work and then just to have that thrown back in my face was um, was hard. So how does this story tie into how you didn't want to pursue San Mateo in Arcetri as the origin of this manuscript? The thing about San Mateo in Arcetri is that it is it was the subject of a Pulitzer-nominated non-fiction book by Dava Sobel called Galileo's Daughter because Galileo Galilei's daughter, Virginia Galilei, became Suor Maria Celeste Galilei and spent uh, the majority of her life at San Mateo in Arcetri. I'm just sniffing a sequel here on the wind. Vincenzo Galilei's daughter. Because I had no hard proof and because I'd been so stung, I was actively looking to not find the origins of this book of polyphony in San Mateo in Arcetri. I thought, a, lightning doesn't strike twice, right? 
never know. And B, um, if I come out and say that this book has a has a link to San Mateo, I'm just going to get the same kind of pushback about my work. So I spent a lot of time and money financing trips to Florence to try and find Agnoletta Bifoli and Clemencio Sostegni in the archives of San Jacopo in Via Ghibellina. And I couldn't. So we fast forward to early 2020. By now, you've made a documentary about this music. You've had concerts lined up. You've made a CD recording. Tell us about what happens next. In late January 2020, I decided that I was just going to go to Florence and I was going to sort this mess out because even though we had released a CD and I'd made the documentary and uh, and everything, it was it was bugging me that I hadn't actually found the evidence. So I uh, packed my bags and took myself off to, to Florence and I spent over a week in the archive, the Archivo di Stato in Florence, with all of the documents of San Jacopo and Via, Via Ghibellina, and I looked through everything that they had from the 15th century up to the 18th century to see if I could find any mention of this book, and there was nothing. So I'd kind of exhausted all that material, and on my last day, um, I was leaving Florence in the afternoon to, uh, to to come back to London on the train. And I looked at the list for San Mateo and I said, oh, okay, there's one book. There's only one book or one binding that pertains to the 16th century. So i uh, got nothing to lose. I might as well have a look at it. And when it arrives, it's three to four inches thick. And I open it up and within five minutes, I'd found the names of both nuns in this ledger of income and expenditure. I knew who their fathers were. I knew what their dowries were. I knew the dates that they'd entered the convent. And suddenly I had a whole load of information that I could then follow up, except that I had to get on the train and go back to England. And this was, you know, the beginning of February 2020. COVID-19 was already in Italy and every night I'd come home from the archive and I'd look at the news and go, mm, this isn't so great. It's not such a bad thing that I'm leaving Italy right now. And I sort of felt like I was being chased across Europe by the virus on the train. Um, and the problem that I had then though, because I I'd, I'd then found the nuns is we had concerts set up and I made this documentary that pointed to, I'm literally pointing to San, San Jacopo and Via Ghibellina and saying, look at this convent. And I had to let that documentary run at the beginning of the concert and then say, okay, that's a great story, but that's not how it happened. And so that's a great story, but I've got an even better one now. You really thought this was pure anonymous convent music, but now let me remove the curtain and we find... <laughs> In fact, we've jumped on the Galilei bandwagon. You fools! We've sold out and there's nothing you can do about it. It's too late. You already like it. Give me your money! I'm rich! <laughs> okay, that's at least how I imagine it went, but uh, probably that probably didn't happen. So very publicly, I had to roll back on stuff that I'd already put out there. And, you know, I think for some researchers that might have been difficult. I didn't actually find it because I'm, you know, I, I really want people to know the truth. And I don't want ever to be be thought that I'm spinning stories unreasonably. The story about San Jacopo that I put together was logical and acceptable and you know any historian would go yeah actually that that makes sense but it wasn't the right story so when you find new details when you're writing history um, or when you're thinking about music when you find more details you feed them in you know if you have a musical score and you find a draft score or a different edition something that the that the that the composer had done later to change it then that changes the story that you tell when you perform it because it has changed so you know we need to be open to seeing history and performance and performing historical music as a process it's never really quite finished <laughs> 
Although Laurie's discovery of the Bifoli Sosteni manuscript is exactly in line with the goals of our movement, the story about her process attributing the manuscript demonstrates that the early music movement itself is very much part of a living culture. After being accused that she was cashing in on the Borgia's craze a decade ago, Strauss, in fact, avoided connecting this manuscript to the convent which housed the daughter of Galileo Galilei. Here, a success in modern popular culture dictated how she would go about researching music of the past. Furthermore, once she realized her error, Laurie immediately clarified this point to audiences in concerts only days later. The fact that these events took place under the shadow of a looming pandemic also helps contextualize not only her story in our minds, but it now connects our own social history to that particular manuscript, convent, and music. And, well... It also is exactly the kind of Indiana Jones-style story that I was hoping to hear about in episode 6 with Ben Bagby. Finally, as we established at the beginning of this episode, when it comes to the music of the Renaissance both then and now, star power has had a role to play. Despite Laurie's efforts to avoid it, this manuscript can now be connected to Maria Celeste Galilei. And, I know what you're thinking... But she's no Josca or Palestrina! Putting a name to this music, especially one which we know today, helps legitimize it in our performance culture. It just goes to show you, though, not everything about early music needs to be rediscovered. Some things never left. And so we come to the end of this episode. My thanks to Laurie Strauss for joining me today. All of the music in today's episode comes from the Bifoli Sosteni manuscript performed by Laurie's group, Musica Secreta. You can find a link to that album on the episode's webpage. The link to the page is in the show notes. And so ends this, the 10th and final episode of Season 3 of the Early Music Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Andrew Byrne, and thanks for listening.